Good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of our work on uh, lake char diversity at Isle Royale Lake Superior. Uh, this is a paper that was uh, recently submitted. Uh, it's part of a much larger project to uh, describe and catalog diversity in the species across the, the range. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors here because uh, I'm kind of the uh, closer on this. Uh, these folks did the bulk of the work in terms of collection and processing of uh, samples. So early on, uh, early naturalists as well as uh, managers and biologists recognized uh, that lake, char lake trout were diverse uh, throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, this paper on the left here uh, was written uh, in 1884 by George Good. Uh, described several lake trout morphs uh, throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and this paper down here uh, by Goodyear in 1981 described as many as 10 different lake, tr lake trout morphs uh, within the Canadian waters of Lake Superior. So it was uh, recognized early on that these morphs were distinct and easily recognized. <clears throat> so that's uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> best highlighted by this quote. It states that uh, the amateur is likely to confound the Nemekush, here they're referring to the lean lake trout form, with the Siskoet, but once the differences are once pointed out, no confusion of the two again arises. The fishermen recognize them as they're being hauled out of the water. Even Indian children recognize them at a glance. So clearly these things were distinct and uh, easily recognized. So just to kind of run through <clears throat> the three common forms that are currently recognized by Lake Superior biologists, these are uh, illustrations done by our colleague Paul Vecce. This is the typical uh, lean morph, uh, it's a shallow water form, streamlined body condition and very low body fat content. <clears throat> this is the humper morph, uh, typically occupies offshore humps and banks, characterized by very large eyes set high on the head with low to intermediate body fat content. <clears throat> and this is the big boy, the Siskoet, uh, deep water form, uh, characterized by a rounded snout very deep mid-body and high body fat content. So our objectives uh, were first to uh, ask the question, do three morphs occur at Isle Royale? And there's been a lot of work, as we all know, done on Isle Royale lake trout morphs. Uh, we revisited these populations uh, in the 2000s, mid-2000s, and asked the questions, do three morphs occur? Second objective was to uh, determine whether grouping method altered the assignment of each individual to a group or a morph. And then third, uh, to ask the question, do morphs differ in terms of their buoyancy and depth, so habitat use? Uh, this is a schematic of our uh, sampling sites here. You can see they're distributed around the island. Uh, we group these uh, sampling events into three depth bins, so less than 50 meters, 50 to 100 meters, and then greater than 100 meters. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to quickly run through our, uh, our methods here. We sampled over a thousand fish. We limited this analysis to fish that were greater than 400 millimeters in length, uh, in part because of ontogenetic shifts in diet and morphology that occur around that size, as demonstrated by Zimmerman and others. We used then three methods to group each individual into, into a group or a morph. Uh, the first was based on body shape. Uh, the second was based on head shape, and then the third we had three biologists uh, run through and assign these things visually to a group. Uh, so note there the numbers in the grouping methods. The body shape uh, models uh, resulted in 36 variables being generated. The head shape models resulted in 52 variables being generated. And so to reduce the dimensionality of those data, we ran them through a principal component analysis and retained the first four components for further analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we then um, took those principal components and ran them through a clustering uh, program that was implemented in R. It's called MCLUST. And the nice thing here is that you don't have to assign these individuals ahead of time to groups. You ask the question on the basis of these data, how many groups are most likely present? And so we did that with the body shape and the head shape models. Uh, we then, uh, for all individuals where our visual assignments disagreed, we then met and conferred and came to a visual consensus if we could 
in terms of which group those uh, individuals belonged. And then we set up a series of decision rules to then take those three grouping methods and come up with uh, an overall consensus. So the idea here was that we had a set of fixed rules. One, for example, was if the head shape model and the body shape model grouped an individual into the same group, then we use that grouping method. Uh, we then took those overall uh, consensus assignments of individuals and asked questions about whether or not these things differ in terms of typical linear measures that are used to classify uh, lake trout morphs. Uh, do they differ in terms of buoyancy? And I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in a further slide here. And then do they differ in terms of their, their depth use? So this is just to give you an idea of uh, the landmarks we use to characterize head and body shape as well as the uh, eight or so linear measures that we uh, collected from each individual. Yeah. So jumping into the results, th these are the results of the head shape model. You can see that uh, three groups were most likely present on the basis of head shape. Uh, across the uh, bottom axis here, uh, you can see that about 38% of the variation was accounted for. Uh, across the y-axis, 14% uh, of the variation. One thing to note here is that we got nice uh, discrimination of things that generally conform to what we call leans, humpers, and siscoet, but you can see that there's a huge amount of overlap here and a high degree of variation in terms of the groups. When we ran the model for body shape, we came up with four groups. <clears throat> so the typical lean, humper, and siscoet grouped out fairly well. And we've got this other form here that grouped out and based on some of the characteristics, we're calling this thing a redfin here. So I'll kind of run through uh, some of that in the next few slides. A redfin is a form that was described historically mostly by anecdotal accounts by fishermen as well as uh, some of the um, uh, sport anglers as well. But there's really no quantitative description of that form. So we're, we're sort of assigning it to that based on what we can kind of gather from the historical uh, information. So this is what it looks like. This is a, an illustration that uh, Paul did. Uh, generally what it looks like, characterized as living in deep water, similar to the Sisquet, has very large eyes and a large head and extremely long fins in comparison to the other forms. Uh, they tended to have these red fins, although color is not a great uh, you know, characteristic for identifying things, but many of these had these red fins and very high fat content, as you'll see in, in the next couple of slides, so even higher than uh, Sisquet in the very deep water. <clears throat> so we used uh, percent agreement among the uh, three biologists to get a handle on how well we were able to group these uh, individuals into the morphs. <clears throat> so this is a, a plot on the y-axis of percent agreement among the three biologists, uh, or sorry, uh, percent agreement on the, on the x-axis versus uh, percentage of individuals on the y-axis. And so you can see that we had 0% agreement for a fairly high number of individuals. And, th and that essentially means that all three of us identified these things as a different morph. 67% uh, agreement for about 141 of, of the five or 600 samples. And then we had complete agreement for about 310, so roughly half the samples. When we looked at it on the basis of each individual morph, we had 90% agreement for leans, which is kind of what we expect because they're, they're much easier to identify, typical characteristics. 84% uh, for Siskoets, again, that's sort of what we expected going into this. We had about 60%, 69% agreement for humpers and only 15 for red fins, but that's in part due to the methods that we employed. So, uh, you know, we were, we were set up to search for these three common morphs that we uh, typically characterized and everything else was dumped into an other bin. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the folks identifying fish here had, had noted that in this other bin there appeared to be two groups and one of those groups actually sort of fit with this red fin idea. So we went back through and, uh, and reclassified some of those when we were doing the consensus. So that's why percent agreement is, is low here. This is a plot of uh, model uncertainty, so this is kind of a secondary uh, metric of how well these things group out. This is based on the models. Model uncertainty is one minus the probability of assigning an individual to a group uh, versus uh, the different groups along the x-axis. And so there are a couple things to note here. The left panel is for the head shape model. 
you can see roughly uh, around 0.2 uh, was the uncertainty for uh, each of those groups. Leans slightly lower, but not significantly so. Uh, the right panel is for body shape, and you can see that leans, the model was, was, was really good at, at grouping leans and identifying leans, and that's kind of what we had expected going in. Uh, and uncertainty was significantly lower for the lean group compared to the other groups. But again, a high degree of uncertainty here, lots of variation, suggesting that the model was also, the models were also having difficulty in assigning these things to groups. So it's consistent with our, our visual assignments. This gives you a sense of how shape, this is size free body shape varied among these four morphs. That's kind of what we expect, leans at the bottom having very narrow, body, long caudal peduncle, and a pointed snout versus Cisco at, at the top here having a very uh, deep body, short peduncle, and a slope snout. So it's consistent with what we know about those two uh, groups, and you can see the other two groups sort of in between there. Uh, red fins having a, a slight difference here in terms of that uh, front end of the body and the shape. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a plot of uh, percent buoyancy for the four morphs. So buoyancy is calculated by, or is measured by weighing the fish suspended in water and then weighing it in air. And it's calculated as uh, the weight of the fish in water divided by the weight of the fish in air. And it gives you a sense of how buoyant that fish is. Now this is percent buoyancy. So a low percent buoyancy, so at the bottom end of that uh, y-axis, means that the fish is light in water. Uh, it's correlated with body lipid content. So if it's light in water, it has higher lipids in the body tissue which is what we expect of ciscoettes. Versus the other end of the spectrum, heavy in water, is what we expect of, of leans. Uh, it's a buoyancy strategy mechanism for moving up and down in the water column. So a couple things to note here. Uh, the, the dark circles, the top line there, represent leans. You can see that they are heavier in water across those three depth bins. Uh, second thing to note here is that uh, there's an increasing trend in terms of buoyancy as you move to the deeper depth bins. So uh, fish are, are roughly similar in these shallower depth bins, but as you move into the deep water, fish are tending, it seems, to be more buoyant in the deep water. Uh, and finally, red fin morph that we identified here is, is much less, uh, uh, or much lighter in water, or much more buoyant compared to uh, the other morphs. This is a plot of uh, catch per net. These are standardized nets we use to sample. Uh, so a net set is a 24-hour set. Uh, and this shows catch per net across those three depth bins. You see here a couple of things. Uh, leans were more abundant in the shallower depth bin, which is what we expect. <coughs> Ciscoettes generally were uh, much more abundant across those two deeper depth bins, uh, again, what we expect. Uh, but there really wasn't much difference in terms of uh, the, other, the other morph abundance in the mid-depth bin and the deep-depth bin. So just to summarize, uh, we identified four groups on the basis of both visual identifications and the body shape uh, model, uh, roughly conforming to lean humpers and, and what we're calling a putative redfin morph. Uh, model and visual group assignments were, were generally consistent. There's high variation within morphs and weak clustering, uh, as well as high uncertainty in model assignment, as well as a, a relatively low percent agreement among the biologists assigning these things. And that's consistent with what we've heard uh, from the Lake Superior Technical Committee. Actually, there was some work done at a com uh, technical committee meeting years ago where Mark Ebner and others uh, had folks identify mm -hmm. trout morphs and found that there was really very low agreement among all these folks identifying these morphs. So there's a huge amount of variation, making it very difficult to group things into bins. Uh, and that leads to the final summary point here is that differentiation uh, in, in a contemporary setting is very low. And there are two uh, not necessarily mutually exclusive explanations here. One is introgression and hybridization, and the second is ecological reorganization. So just to kind of follow up on this, uh, this last point here, <coughs> excuse me. This is kind of a schematic of uh, some of the changes that have gone on in Lake Superior. Uh, the top section there is the 1800s and uh, 
we're saying based on these historical accounts and anecdotal accounts that diversity was well organized, morphs were easy to recognize, and they were very distinct. During the 1900s, you had a period of uh, high commercial fishing. Uh, you had, on the right-hand side, losses of some of the uh, native prey species. On the left-hand side, you had inputs here, the sea lamprey, uh, the rainbow smelt, and then you also had a significant input in terms of stalking. And so those changes could have acted to shape the diversity that we're seeing here today. And so in the 2000s, you get a situation where you have this huge amount of variation. Whether or not it, that variation is expanding or reorganizi reorganizing uh, is, is unknown at this point. And so uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end and uh, take any questions if you have any.